Welcome, everybody, to the Be Kind Podcast. This is Joe Kirkner, joined today by John Beck, and all the way from our northern friends up in Canada, Dr. Joe Anderson. Hello, hello, everyone. Hey. Hi. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And thank you, listener, for tuning in. And just as a quick reminder, we're part of the Animal Advocates of South Central PA's mission to create a more loving and compassionate world for all living creatures, all types, all shapes, all sizes. We want them all to be loved, and we're part of the network of podcasts on iTunes, Google, Spotify, and many other places where podcasts are sold. So if you're not subscribed yet, you totally should be. And today we're here to talk about Dr. Joe Anderson's work and learn a little bit more about the different fields of research and everything that goes on behind the scenes of a lot of the vegan-based or animal-related statistics we see thrown around by a lot of these major think tanks and companies. So um, Dr. Anderson, would you mind telling us about your most recent study we've been exchanging emails about prior to this interview. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I work for an organization called Faunalytics, who do some of that research you're talking about, specifically looking at questions that we think will help animal advocates be more effective in the work that they're trying to do. And the study that you're talking about is one that we just put out where we looked at the impact of different animal products when people eat them. So looking at impact in terms of the number of lives that are taken to produce, for instance, chicken nuggets or bacon or uh, scrambled eggs, it gets very specific like that. And what we were able to do was combine publicly available data from a couple of different sources, some of which uh, was looking at the foods that people eat on a daily basis And on the other hand, information that we have from government and other sources talking about the lives of the animals that are slaughtered to produce those foods. So looking at the length of their lives, that is the number of days that they're suffering in a factory farm, for instance, how many obviously are killed to produce these foods each day, and things as well like animals that are fed to other animals uh, as part of their diet while they're being raised or um, animals that die prior to being slaughtered for human consumption. As I was looking over the study and looking at the findings, something that struck out to me was it seems to go almost contrary to a lot of the bullet points that advocates throw out, like uh, that beef is one of the most inefficient forms of food around there or you can grow X number of soybeans or oatmeal or whatever, insert vegan vegetarian option here for the amount of time it takes to raise one pig. But looking at this list, a lot of things at the top are things like eggs and chicken and fish, which don't necessarily come up as those um, hallmark statistics that vegan advocates like to throw out. So is that something that surprised you as you were doing this study? It didn't surprise us per se, because from the animal ethics perspective, if you consider every animal life equal, then an animal with a smaller body like a chicken or a fish uh, has to be killed in larger numbers to produce the same amount of consumable product. So that's why you see with our list, which just comes down to that, that question of one life being equal to another, you see it dominated by chicken and fish products up at the top. You'll also see pigs up there a fair bit, but part of the reason for that is that we discovered in the process of doing this that pigs are actually fed quite a few fish over the course of their lifetime, somewhere in the vicinity of 50 to 60 fish per pig as they're raised. So the difference is when you're seeing those stats about uh, cows being raised and the inefficiency is from an environmental perspective a lot of the time. And I don't see it as contrary or contradictory in any way. It's just a different way of looking at the issues around agriculture, animal farming on this scale. And that's maybe a good thing for advocates because it means that you can talk about the downsides of all of these different animal products. You can talk about cows from the perspective of environmental concerns and uh, you can talk about chicken and fish from the perspective of animal ethics concerns and the numbers that are slaughtered whatever will work best for talking to your audience. We've already talked a little bit about some of the findings, but could you give us just the bird's eye overview of the basic findings and maybe any call to actions that resulted from those findings? Yeah, so we produced a number of different lists out of this. It 
uh, the, the main ones focus on the number of animals that it takes to feed the U.S. population every single day. So the numbers are just staggering. I'm sure that your listeners are not going to be surprised by them, but I think to the average person, hearing some of these is is pretty impactful. So for instance, even just at the very specific level of looking at unbattered fish fillets, so not, not fish as a whole, unbattered fish fillets, it takes 5.7 million lives every single day to feed the U.S. population the unbattered fish fillets that they are eating. If we were able to replace all of those with plant-based alternatives, that's how many lives we could save every single day. So I think big takeaway number one is just the scale of the impact here, even when we're looking so specifically, not just at, you know, what type of animal, but the really specific products. And what that means is that if you're talking to individuals or you're talking to companies, either way, you don't have to rely on them giving up everything at the same time, because some people are just going to shut down as soon as you make that kind of argument. I'm sure we've all had that experience. You're trying to convince someone to go vegan and it's just, it's a flat no, it's never going to happen for them. And if you can start from a smaller scale, talking about cutting out one or two things and then working on it over time, getting them to move in that direction, uh, that can have a lot more impact on the whole rather than people just shutting it down entirely and turning away from the conversation. Something that left out to me as I was looking over the results is unbreaded shrimp, uh, 2.5 billion. That's that's correct, right? That's not a typo. That's a billion. That is not a typo, unfortunately. Because yeah. everyone else has um, those ex- still extremely depressing M's in front of them. Though unbred shrimp is the only one I see that has 2.5 billion days of suffering per day of consumption of the U.S. And at first that was confusing to me, but then what you just said earlier makes a lot more sense is shrimp are really small. So you need to have a lot more shrimp out there suffering in order to create the caloric and food uh, quantity exactly. needed to be a sufficient serving of food. So, that, And have you ever heard of someone eating just one shrimp? That's not, you know, that's right. not how it works. People pride themselves seemingly on how many shrimp they can eat in mm-hmm. one sitting. So, yeah, that's a lot of lives. Could you explain your methodology behind determining what a day of suffering constitutes? Yeah, so that's the terminology we use because we think it has the most impact with the general population. But what it what it literally boils down to is number of days in captivity being raised for slaughter. So it's essentially just days of life. We're calling it days of suffering because we take the position that any animal that's being raised for slaughter for human consumption is suffering every day of their life. And what would your response be to someone who, let's say, only eats beef or dairy or chickens from backyard operations or their local farm that are quote unquote treated humanely and compassionately? Uh, So tricky. I applaud them for making the attempt, but I think in a lot of cases, I'm a psychologist by training. I think in a lot of cases, there's a lot of justification that's going on with that kind of thing, that they are not looking closely at the issues and thinking through what it really means to be raised and slaughtered for someone else to eat you. I don't think that that necessarily works. We, in this study, we aren't we aren't talking about different types or degrees of suffering. As I said, it's just one day of life is one day of suffering if you're being raised for food. And I know that there's a lot of people that might argue with that. And if they want to, it's always possible to sort of adjust how you think of the list. But at the end of the day, I think the difference between a cow that's being raised on an outdoor pasture versus a cow that's being raised in a barn is certainly not as great as one that isn't being used for food at all. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and it takes out a lot of the variability or uh, subjectivity to it as well, because your suffering could be different than my suffering, could be different from John's suffering. and Exactly. The way you just described it, where at the end of the day, will they be happier not in captivity being raised for food? That is unequivocally yes. There's not a creature out there that's feels like it's fortunate for being stuck in a farm regardless of how nice the farm is so i applaud you for that decision 
Exactly. Yeah. There are some measures like this where people attempt to measure impact and they will put those subjective ratings onto it, trying to capture differences in the subjective experience of suffering. And we talked about that in the beginning when we started this study and decided that it's there's so many issues with that. Um, ethical issues, scientific issues, like we just we aren't able to make those kinds of determinations in a way that makes sense. And so I to me, it just is a clear case of just don't try. You're, you know, you're trying to make degrees of difference where really it should just be, okay, a day is a day and it sucks regardless. And I have some other questions, but before I jump in, John, do you have any comments or questions yet? <laughs> no, I'm just captivated by everything you're saying. It's just like, it's stuff, a lot of it's stuff I already sort of knew, but like, it's just like hearing everything you are saying, taking in, it's like, man, there's just so much awful things happening yeah. and we just totally shut our minds off to it and just pretend like there's no issue but we do. I, yeah. I i just i love what you're doing though because that's we we need people like you out there uh exposing this kind of stuff and like getting facts straight so people know what's happening out there thank you and yeah i feel like for me the most impactful possible use of these scales is getting through that armor that people have, that defensiveness, mm -hmm. by just talking about one product at a time or one type category of product at a time rather than hitting them with the really, the thing that puts up the barriers the most, which is just that really hard sell right off the bat. You know, sneak in the back door. Say, oh, do you really need chicken breast every week several right. times? Maybe we can start there. And, you know, they have some really great alternatives that are better for you and also don't hurt animals and just work on it a little at a time. And a lot of times that is a more accessible approach for a lot of people. I think even just the language you use in your reporting and documentation about the study is incredibly effective because we talk a lot about lives taken, animals killed and things like that. And when you have these conversations with people who are resistant, a lot of times, especially if people who grew up on farms, I've discovered they look at animals as tools or commodities, not as creatures and capable of experiencing emotions and feelings. But when you label it as days suffering, that totally reframes the, for lack of a better term, framework of the discussion. And now all of a sudden it's not a object for you to use for your own power, pleasure, ease, or convenience now is a creature capable of experiencing pain and suffering and emotion and feelings, which adds a whole other layer to a whole other level of accountability on part of the consumer. I hope so. Yeah, I really hope it does. I'm glad to hear you say that. Another question I had was, do you ever struggle with ranking the amount of suffering caused by the consumption of each of these different types of animals? For example, someone may say, well, I only eat beef and that only results in 22,000 lives per day of suffering. Whereas this person, they're a pescatarian, they eat all the seafood, and look at all the many millions of billions of days of suffering that come from that. Do you ever struggle with that when you're trying to communicate your findings with people? I think that's a really tough question for anyone who's engaged in, in dietary advocacy. The, the worry that if you convince someone to take one thing out of their diet, they're just going to replace it with something else that's equally bad or worse. And all I can say is frame everything you can uh, as much as possible in terms of not replacing it with some other product that's just as bad, but finding alternatives in the plant-based market. If you start from that kind of framework of talking about the great plant-based options that people have, they also come with the better health and environmental benefits, that frames it right away as here's the thing that you eat instead and that thing that you're eating instead is not going to have those additional harms that would come if if all you've done is convince them not to eat chicken and then they switch to fish or they switch to beef. Yeah, we don't want that for sure. That said, I think that with this list where you are seeing chickens and fish dominating the top of the list, I think that's less of a concern potentially than with some of those environmental arguments because I don't know too many people who are willing to switch from chickens and fish to red meat. Everyone's kind of familiar at this point with all the health problems of red meat. And so I think it's a, it would be a tougher switch for them to do that. And I, I don't know for sure, but I, I would 
hope that if you can convince them to take on to try out some plant-based products that that would be pretty effective and that they wouldn't be too likely to switch to eating a pork product or a beef product. Do you have any numbers or data speaking to the amount of lives saved or days suffering spared for an individual consumer? Because I'm trying to think of, I, I like playing devil's advocate, so I'm trying to think of a barrier that someone might have when they look at this number saying, well, the reason chicken and seafood so high because their consumption is so ubiquitous and common across our society. What would little old Joe Schmo me giving up chicken actually do for any of these numbers where it's such a widespread phenomenon that really it would just be a drop in the bucket? Exactly. Yeah. And we definitely don't want people to have that sense of not having any power to make a difference themselves. And so we have the two scales that are at the level of the total U.S. consumption, uh, which is, you know, lives taken and days of suffering. But then we also have them at the individual level. And for that, we did it in terms of each serving that someone would eat. So an average serving size of something like uh, battered fish fillets, eggs, fish used in soup, and for those, you can look at the scale and see, for instance, with those battered fish fillets, that 12 days of suffering go to every serving you eat. And I don't know about the average person, but to me, I would find that very impactful. Not that I am sitting down with a fish fillet, but if I were thinking about it, that just thinking about an animal suffering for 12 days just to get me that one meal, that's pretty big. And we have it in terms of lives as well. So we have both of those resources available for individuals. And we'll put a link to all these resources in the show notes so you can go and check it out yourself. And what is the biggest takeaway you got from this data or something that surprised you the most? I think it shouldn't have surprised me, but I was surprised to see eggs so much near the top of the list. So specifically, it's the days of suffering lists because uh, layer hens are not slaughtered until they've stopped producing eggs at the rate that the that the farms want but in terms of the days of suffering you know they spend their entire lives in those conditions and the days of suffering add up insanely quickly and again with eggs like with shrimp people don't generally just eat one egg so it really adds up a lot and seeing uh, scrambled eggs and omelets at the very top of the list it kind of blew me away a little that 201 million days of suffering for every single day of people eating scrambled eggs and omelets in the U.S. Like, that's just staggering. So I think that was the biggest thing for me. Yeah, I was going to ask, how do you separate it? Sometimes people might think, well, is it better to die early or suffer for a long time? But you include both those numbers in your data. You include lives required for people eating omelets or people eating fish sticks and also the days of suffering that go behind that. So you already guessed my question. So again, <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah, we try to do both because it is, it's such a subjective question. The, the ethics of all of this, everyone has an opinion and they often don't agree. And so we tried to come up with a system that allowed us to take account of everything. And I think the great thing about it is that you can clearly see even though there are differences when you look at the number of lives or the numbers of days of suffering, that overall, it's pretty clear what kinds of foods it's better to give up or replace with plant-based. First, I should not say, not full stop, what you should give up first and work on finding alternatives for. Chicken products, egg products, fish products, and then pork products, really, um, are all really great stepping stones in the right direction. And that's... Another very interesting point, because those are products that do not have, as far as I know, a very staple mainstream vegan alternative. I don't know too many. There's no impossible fish or impossible chicken out mm -hmm. there, as far as I know right now. So what alternatives would you recommend to someone looking to give up these animal products? Yeah, you're right. No, no impossible fish or chicken yet. But I, I hope that that's in the works, and I strongly suspect that it is. I think being, I'm, so I'm living in Canada, I'm Canadian, I think that the products we have tend to be a little different uh, from what you have available, but generally what I recommend to people is looking for recipe websites themselves that cater to the type of food that they generally enjoy eating, because the easier you can make the switch, 
the more likely it is that you'll be able to stick to it. So for myself, you know, I am not a health food vegan. I am a comfort food vegan. Same. I, yeah, right? So, you know, I need to find websites that are going to tell me how to make a good burger and fries and poutine because, again, Canadian. Um, <laughs> and that's what will help me maintain my veganism. But that's not necessarily what someone else needs. So whether it's at the product level or the recipe level, I think just looking for something that fits your current lifestyle and, you know, what you're trying to do and how you enjoy food, how you experience food with others is really important to find that fit. So how long have you been vegan for again? Um, my vegan journey started <laughs> about two years ago, okay. I want to say, maybe three. And I wouldn't call myself a per perfect vegan today, but I'm, I'm pretty good. <laughs> and uh, it started when I joined Phonolytics as the research director. Oh, okay. Before that, I was vegetarian for about 15 years. And I just never thought about it that much. <laughs> so that, you know, that's kind of the thing. Like, you know what's happening uh, with the food that you're eating, where it's coming from. But if you don't, if you're defensive and you don't take the time to really look at that critically, you can just keep doing it forever. I kept doing it for 15 years, eating eggs and dairy. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah, I'm this, I was the same way. I was vegetarian for 15 years. And then when I turned 25, I went vegan and I've been vegan ever since. And I mean, that's 14 years I've been vegan now. And I, 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 it, I always knew about it, but I just never, I just couldn't stop myself. And then finally it was just like, all right, I got to do this. And then I did it. But it sounds exactly. like you had a similar situation, except yours was a little bit more extreme because it was involving your work. <laughs> so, I, Well, it was, it was the social support or the social, yeah, just having people around me who are thinking about these things all the time and were good role models. That's really important for helping people make a change and stick to it is having those people around them. So I'm a really good example of that. And and I think also of just the different styles or ways that people can make change. Because mm -hmm. when I went vegetarian, I did it overnight. And it was not hard for me at the time. Mm -hmm. That isn't the case for everyone. And going vegan was an incredibly different process. Same person, but just a completely different experience. I found it way harder. And it's taken me over two years to transition to the point where I finally feel comfortable saying, yes, I am vegan. Mm -hmm. I am not a perfect vegan, but I'm <laughs> vegan. It's just such a different experience. And having this kind of resource, I hope, will help other people make that transition. Yeah. That I think if I had had this two years ago showing the amount of harm that eggs do, that would have been a lot easier to cut out a lot sooner. Yeah, so I'm with you on that. And, and it's kind of funny that you mentioned uh, – being the perfect vegan because we just had a guest on last week uh who was doing our vegan challenge and she was i was telling her you know try not to beat yourself up uh when you're in your early stages of veganism because it's not about being perfect it's about doing the best you can and mm -hmm. so that's i always try and tell people that because when i first went vegan it was so hard because there was really nothing out there <laughs> for vegans and now it's so much different and there's more things out there but yeah i i always try and tell people don't beat yourself up because <laughs> you will make mistakes along the way so but i i think it's great what you're doing exactly and thank you yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think what you're doing, like you said earlier, is just getting people to think about differently. And not everyone's going to resonate with everything we make. Some people, like me, love numbers. If you show me a bunch of numbers and have the logic and reason out, well, yeah, why wouldn't I go vegan? Other people go, what you, language are you speaking? And you show me a picture of a cute baby goat and they're sold. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone's got what works for them. And you're just adding another tool to the vegan advocate toolbox. <laughs> exactly yeah there's no one size fits all so we hope that this will just help yeah and I, I think it will and i have a question about just scientific inquiry in general uh, mm -hmm. scientists a lot of times you have to be objective and just pursue the greater knowledge for the sake of knowledge essentially and not go in there with any preconceived notions or a biased hypothesis or things like that if my sixth grade science class is <laughs> remembered correctly, scientific inquiry. It's perfect, yep. <laughs> but with vegan advocacy, 
when you go in there, you have a specific agenda. You know what you want to show. You want to show that this is the right thing to do when these animals are suffering. How do you balance that um, subjective goal versus the objective nature of pure science? Uh, it's interesting. To me, they're not separate goals. Being an unbiased scientist is part of my ethical stance on the world. And the reason that we care about animals, the reason we care about animal suffering is partially just because of the evidence about the fact that they're suffering. So that's not, you know, I'm not coming to the science with that agenda, that that agenda comes to me through the science. But your question about conducting your own research in an unbiased way, we do that in a few ways. We, we rarely actually have a sort of preferred answer that we would want to get for one thing. So oftentimes the type of work that we're doing, we want to find what is the best way or another good way of helping advocates be more effective. I don't necessarily care what that way is. I just want to know what it is so that I can tell it to the people who can use it on the ground. So oftentimes there is no kind of inherent motivation to find one thing or another. But even if there is, um, we do a number of things to prevent the appearance of bias, whether you know whether it's actually plausible or not um, that it might be occurring. We will pre-register our studies, which means saying ahead of time before we collect the data or before we look at the data, what our hypotheses are and say why we think that the results will come out the way that they do. And you post that information online um, on a source called the Open Science Framework where it's frozen in time so you can't touch it afterward and change it to say something else. It's there, it says what you expect to happen and how you're gonna check whether that is what happened. And when you analyze your results, you have what you said you thought would happen and now you have what actually did and you can say, look, it came out that way or it didn't. And anyone can check that what you've done is legitimate and not just something that you've made up to, to find the answer that you wanted to find. That's awesome. I actually did check out that website before this podcast and I saw all the cool stuff. I read up on the methodology and oh my goodness, the amount of work you put into that methodology of determining specifically the amount of days. I can't imagine how many different sources you had to pull through, whether it's consumer reports, operations, biology. It was it was it was not light Saturday morning reading, let me tell you. <laughs> it was not. No, I, I wouldn't recommend the methodology document to anyone who's looking for a beach read. <laughs> and something else I'd like to hear a little bit more about is how vegan-related research is perceived in the scientific community. I'm thinking for things like cooking, people say, yeah, that's pretty good cake, or that's a pretty good pasta dish, or that's a pretty good lasagna for a vegan dish. If you run to the same kind of thing in scientific research where, yeah, that's a really great, robust study for a vegan one. <laughs> um, generally speaking, I have found that sort of academic journals and sources are accepting of research that's done well. So if you are using best practices and methodology and you're pre-registering your studies to show that you're not just following an agenda uh, that tends to be well received. What often can be more of an issue is, uh, so in this context of writing up an article for an academic journal, you, you give some background on it, right? You give context, why this is important, all of that. That's where you'll sometimes see some pushback if you're talking about animal suffering or why we should not exploit animals for our own entertainment, for instance. You may see reviewers saying things about whether this is really true, are they really suffering, do we actually know this, um, and wanting you to talk about it in a different way. Like It's not just accepted as true necessarily in the scientific community that animal welfare and animal suffering are important issues. So that's where I see a little bit more, but not on the research per se, as long as it's done well. And I just want to have the listeners know that if they would like to do some research, maybe not a peer-reviewed scientific article, but maybe if they just want to collect some local data about vegan phenomenons or trends, what would you suggest how they go about doing that? Uh, well, I hope they'll come check out our website. We've got a section on research advice for designing your own study. 
and you know writing survey questions um, if you need to do an experiment how you go about that and we also have uh, office hours that are open to anyone who can come and ask questions about how to conduct research or um, on the sort of the library side of what we do more like I'm looking for data about the number of cows that are killed in the US every year can you help me find that data so both of those types of things we offer during these virtual office hours that anyone is welcome to drop in on. Something that's just been blowing my mind the more we get into this podcast and talking with other vegan groups is how accessible you all are. Literally, I could pick up the phone and call any of these vegan groups we've talked to and get a hold of their CEO pretty easily. It's very <laughs> impressive and very much appreciated. And I'm sure the animals very much appreciate it too. That's great. Yeah. And, and we love it when people do do that. So I hope that your listeners will check us out and reach out. All of our resources are available and really like our entire reason for being is to support other animal advocates. So we hope that people come and use the resources. And I'm also going to plug your stuff too. They have so many articles about every topic you can possibly imagine. So I subscribe to their newsletter and it's so cool to get and see the kind of things they're talking about. And I, we have some cool episodes that hopefully if I didn't botch this interview too much, we'll get to interview <laughs> some other people on your team about some other amazing studies you've been doing to get the word out and really show people the extent of the vegan movement, animal consumption and its impact, and really just paint the picture with as many colors as possible. That would be, that would be great. We would love to come back or my colleagues would love to come back as well. So I hope that you will invite us back. <laughs> Well, any final words for our listeners, Joe? Just thank you for the work that you're doing for animals, for supporting the animals and each other. It's really important, like you said, just animal advocates supporting each other, being a community and helping all of us be more effective. So I hope that you'll continue to do that and check out Faunalytics. Um, let us help you be effective. Yes, and thank you so much for coming on. And something you can do, listener, to help further the movement is just share this podcast right now. Shameless plug. <laughs> or you could send us an email at bekindpodcast at gmail.com and we'll get back to you. If you have any ideas for a show, questions, comments, follow-up questions for any of our guests, I'd be more than happy to pass them along. But I always put information about them in the show notes. John. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on and we really appreciate you. You are awesome. Keep up the great work. Seriously. Oh, thank you. And Same to you too. <laughs> and thank you everybody for listening and both Joes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's about it. Three, two, one. Meow, meow, meow. 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 Meow, meow, meow.